If you take a piece of paper, cut it in half and then cut it to smaller and smaller pieces, what do you get? This is a similar kind of thought experiment which Greek philosopher Democritus pondered in around 400 BC. He concluded that if we keep cutting, we'll find that everything is made up of tiny eternal particles. He called them atomos, meaning indivisibles. But it wasn't until the 19th century that Democritus was proven right. Not completely. The first point, atoms exist, yes. Atoms are indivisible, no. Now we all know that atoms are tiny composite particles that arrange in various patterns to form molecules. And inside the atom, we have protons, electrons and neutrons. We find some atoms are stable while some are unstable. Some are charged and some are neutral. Now, what makes these atoms behave so differently? Why do some atoms produce fission reaction while some do not? Is there something going on inside an atom that makes them act accordingly? Let's jump into the quantum realm like Ant-Man and find out what's going on inside an atom. My name is Siddharth and you're watching The World of Science. As Democritus rightly guessed, atoms are the basic units of matter. Like Lego bricks, atoms can be put together in many different ways to make up everything in our universe, including Lego bricks. But then Democritus pictured solid atomos, while real atoms are mostly empty space. In fact, the modern picture of atoms bears striking resemblance with the solar system. Now let's try to visualize this. At the center lies the biggest, most massive object, the nucleus, just like the sun. And uh, stretching the analogy a little further, exactly like the sun which is made up of two elements, hydrogen and helium, the nucleus is made up of two entities, protons and neutrons. And way out in the distance are lighter electrons orbiting the nucleus, just like our planets orbit the central star. Except the electrons are not balls, they're more like fuzzy objects. So how do we know all of this? British physicist Joseph John Thomson was the first ever to make an attempt at dissecting an atom in the 1890s. Through a series of experiments, he found out that atoms consisted of positively and negatively charged particles. Using cathode rays like the ones that powered the old big TVs, he went further. He showed that the negatively charged particles, which he named corpuscles, were significantly lighter than the mass of an atom. In fact, 1840 times lighter than a hydrogen atom. Unfortunately, Thomson wrongly pictured these tiny corpuscles, which were later named electrons, swimming in a ball of positively charged matter. You know, like plums in a plum pudding. This was the famous Thomson's plum pudding model. But then came physicist Ernest Rutherford. Unconvinced by the plum pudding model, Rutherford led a series of gold foil experiments from 1908 to 1913 along with physicists Ernest Marsden and Hans Geiger. Their experiments centered on the so-called alpha particles. Interestingly, Rutherford himself had discovered the alpha particles, building on the works of radioactivity pioneers Marion Pierre Curie and Henry Becquerel. Today, we know that alpha particles are two protons and two neutrons bound together like a helium-4 nucleus. But during that time, alpha particles were viewed as useful, high-speed, positively charged projectiles with the mass of an atom emitted by radioactive elements. Rutherford's team fired these alpha particles through a thin gold foil and recorded how they scatter. Now, if Thomson was right about atoms being completely empty, then these alpha particles should have streamed straight through the gold foil. But that's not what the scientists saw. Although most of the particles did go through the foil, some deflected and some even bounced straight back. This convinced Rutherford that atoms had a different structure. He eventually proved that atoms are basically hollow and many negatively charged electrons keep revolving around the positively charged nuclei. In fact, he was the first one to define the size of a nucleus. This wasn't the end of Rutherford's curiosity, because now he wanted to know if the nucleus itself was made up of smaller components. So in the late 1910s, Rutherford discovered that he could split apart the nucleus of a nitrogen atom by firing alpha particles at them. Doing this released what he would later call protons. In this way, Rutherford had split the nucleus in the first ever artificially induced nuclear reaction. Then in 1921, 
He predicted that there must be another particle in the nucleus to keep the protons from flying apart. He dubbed it the neutron and it was finally detected in 1932 by James Chadwick. Later, with the introduction of quantum mechanics to explain electron orbits more accurately by Niels Bohr, Erwin Schrodinger and many quantum pioneers, the atomic model that we still use today was complete. But that was just the beginning of nuclear physics. According to Schrodinger, electrons possess dual nature, which means apart from being particles, there are also waves. And waves that have certain wavelengths can keep revolving around the nucleus. This implies that electrons can only move in discrete levels of shells. Three of the four fundamental forces, electromagnetic force, strong nuclear force and weak nuclear force act within the range of atoms. And although the range of electromagnetic force is way too big, its effects are massive near the range of atoms. The whole mass of an atom is concentrated inside the nucleus. The nucleus is positively charged because of the presence of protons and then the electrons are negatively charged Thus, an attractive force is produced between the two. Inside the nucleus, two nuclear forces govern the situation. The first, strong nuclear force which binds the protons and neutrons together. Second, the weak nuclear force which is responsible for the radioactive decay of the particles. Moving forward, the 20th century saw huge advancements in our understanding and use of the nucleus. For instance, in 1939, scientists Otto Hahn, Lisa Meitner and Otto Frisch discovered nuclear fission, a process by which radioactive elements release energy upon being induced to split. Realizing the huge amount of energy this reaction produced, scientists were assigned the task of using this new knowledge, initially for harm, in the form of atom bombs. Just six years after the discovery of fission, it was used in the atom bombs that destroyed the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and controversially ended the Second World War. Now, at the same time, we probed even further into the nucleus. In 1949, Maria Gopard Meyer, one of the only three women to have won Nobel Prize in physics, along with Hans Jensen, independently proposed that the nucleus had a structure described by its energy levels similar to the theory behind how electrons are arranged in an atom. Mm -hmm. Then, in the 1960s, particle accelerators showed that the nucleus's protons and neutrons are made out of even smaller particles. Mm -hmm. These building blocks of the building blocks of the nucleus are called quarks. Two up quarks and one down quark form a proton. Two down quarks and one up quark form a neutron. But one thing peculiar that was noted inside the nucleus was when the mass of three quarks was added, it summed up to only 1% of the mass of the proton. So then where does the remaining 99% of the mass of proton come from? It actually comes from binding energy. It holds the protons and neutrons together and accounts for almost all the mass of the object. The quarks are bound together with the help of another quantum particle, a boson known as gluon. Gluons are unlike any other boson. Gluons can be visualized as thick glue holding rubber balls together. There is a special property of gluons known as asymptotic freedom. When we pull two quarks apart, the forces between them do not weaken, unlike the electric or the magnetic forces. As the distance between two quarks increases, the energy between them increases too, and this huge amount of energy can create new particles in the process. And so, a pair of two quarks can eventually become two pairs of quarks. Also, gluons can hold on to themselves and exist independently inside the nucleus, forming a gluon-gluon pair. Whereas, weak nuclear force acts completely differently unlike other forces. Weak forces are transmitted through three weak particles, W+, W- and Z0 bosons. These particles, while interacting, can change the structure of the particle, causing the particle to decay. Electrons move around the nucleus as a cloud of probabilities and as waves of discrete wavelengths. As the distance from the nucleus increases, the wavelength increases and thus a large number of electrons reside in the farther orbitals. As the electrons move from lower orbitals to higher orbitals, their speed increases and in the furthermost orbitals of big atoms, electrons move at nearly half the speed of light. As we know from relativity, as the speed increases, there are certain effects such as length contraction and thus the higher orbitals get contracted 
and this effect is more visible in atoms with higher mass, such as gold. An electron absorbs enough energy to reach an excited state and jump to a higher orbital, and later return to its ground state by releasing some energy in form of photons of different wavelengths. Each wavelength corresponds to a particular color, and that's how every element gets its characteristic natural color. So you see, a lot goes inside an atom as per classical and quantum physics. Now, if we try to add something from the string theory, then inside those little quarks are one-dimensional strings of the size of Planck length that keep vibrating and form a particular energy state. So, to sum this up, every phenomenon in the macro world is due to the interplay happening at the microcosm of an atom. Changing the number of electrons and protons changes the very nature of the element and thus it changes the nature of the whole object. So, did you like this video? Let us know in the comments. Make sure you subscribe to the world of science. Until next time, stay scientific.